Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today I want to talk to you about life support in spaceflight. Keeping the human body alive against uh, the harshness of space. The human body needs oxygen, water, food, it needs a nice atmospheric pressure, it needs a nice temperature range. And all the time the human body is uh, sabotaging this by producing things like carbon dioxide, water vapour, methane, ammonia, urine, poop. And a life support system has to deal with all those things. But for all these consumables, there's a sort of time scale implied by these uh, physiological needs. A human body will get affected by a lack of oxygen within a few minutes. But you can survive, you know, maybe a day or so without any water and maybe, you know, several days without food, at least without long term effects. I know like long term you can last quite a while. For reference, long duration space mission, you're talking less than one kilogram of oxygen per day. But on top of that, you've got about three liters of water and another you know, couple of kilograms of food to keep the astronauts sustained under ideal circumstances. And, you know, with poorly designed life support systems, that may mean more or it may mean less. There's been a lot of uh, innovation to reduce these requirements in uh, spacecraft life support. Now, early space missions, they only lasted a very short time and they only really needed to worry about keeping the atmosphere breathable for long enough for the person to get home and have a drink and some food. So the first step is to deliver oxygen to breathe. And that would be, say, from pressurized oxygen bottles or even liquid oxygen, which is more compact to store, but needs to be warmed up before you breathe it. So that solved getting oxygen to the area. Now you have to deal with the exhaled air. Now, exhaled air, of course, contains a small amount of carbon dioxide and it contains water. And if you exhale into a closed space, these build up. The water makes everything humid and the carbon dioxide, well, that'll kill you long before you run out of oxygen. So one simple way option is to just dump the exhaled air overboard. Uh, and there are emergency pressure suits that do this. For example, the Space Shuttle ACES suit, that's the orange pumpkin suit. Uh, that would have an oxygen system that would feed pure oxygen into the helmet and then bleed it out at the same rate so the contaminated gas would escape. In theory this works, but you have massive drawbacks. Partly you're blowing out a lot of unused oxygen, uh, so your supply is being used up faster than it's actually being needed by the body just to get rid of a small amount of carbon dioxide. There was a secondary problem on the space shuttle, and that is because they were venting oxygen out, that would build up in the cabin if there wasn't a pressure leak. And that means that the crew couldn't have the visors down, the faceplates down, during normal operation, because then the cabin would build up and become a you know, tinderbox. So a cabin decompression could happen so quickly that crew would be unable to activate their own pressure suits in time to save them. Anyway, as you probably know, the better way to do life support gases is to remove the carbon dioxide and the water and simply add the new oxygen slowly. And with most spacecraft, they do this using chemical scrubbers that will react with the waste gases. In life support systems, we generally see the use of uh, strong bases, alkaline molecules, things like lithium hydroxide, which will actually firstly absorb the water and then they absorb the carbon dioxide to make lithium carbonates, right? So they act, get activated with the water. Sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide also work for this, but for space flight, lithium is lighter, so that's the first choice. There was actually some research into lithium peroxide, which goes a step further. That reacts with water and it makes oxygen and lithium hydroxide. So you can make carbon dioxide scrubbing material and release oxygen at the same time. But I don't know if that's ever been used on an actual spacecraft. One of the often overlooked technical barriers in creating these filters is that you need your material to be sufficiently porous to allow the atmosphere to permeate through the scrubber material. But it still needs to be strong enough to not fragment and generate dust or debris that can escape the scrubbing system carried along by the airflow. I mean, remember, these scrubbing chemicals are undergoing chemical changes which can uh, modify the structural properties. And also these chemicals are highly alkaline and you really don't want that getting into your eyes. Uh, you know, this is especially important because in zero G, dust that comes out of these things does not settle and it will just persist in the cabin. And yeah, that's why you need to sort these problems out. Anyway, lithium hydroxide scrubbers are commonly used in spacecraft environmental systems. And usually the lithium hydroxide is in the form of canisters, which can be cycled through the air system as they get used up. And of course, this was 
Famously, it famously led to the Apollo 13 craft fair problem where the canisters on the lunar module were a different shape than the canisters on the command module. And when the lunar module canisters were depleted, the crew had to craft this uh, adapter using bags and pipes and stuff so that they could use the command module filters on the lunar module and keep everyone alive. As I understand it, SpaceX's Crew Dragon uh, also uses filters, and uh, but they use filters that were originally designed for submarines, uh, so they're, they're kind of uh, derived from existing material. Now that we've dealt with the CO2 exhaled by humans, there's all sorts of other trace products that you have to come deal with that come out of human metabolism, things like methane from the gut and ammonia from uh, sweat, alcohol sometimes as well. And then there's frequently other molecules coming out from the spacecraft, like off-gassing materials in the vehicle structure. All these need like a broad spectrum charcoal filter or something to just to clean up the air and keep it uh, smelling nice and clean. In the ISS, this is handled by something called the Trace Contaminant Control System. Now, there is, of course, the other problem with lithium hydroxide that it gets used up, right? The spacecraft is on an on orbit for a limited amount of time. That's fine. You can carry enough canisters. Uh, you know, if you want to stay in orbit longer, you just have to bring more of these canisters. But if you want to have a space station that stays on orbit for a long time, you really don't want to be sending up entire cargo spacecraft full of replacement canisters. So one step in that direction was the development of regenerative absorbents like Metox, and that's a silver oxide based scrubber that's been tested on EVA suits. This will absorb the carbon dioxide and the water and then after use, you can take it onto the space station and then bake it and the CO2 will come out and allow you to regenerate the cartridge for use again. But you can take this one step further, you get pressure swing scrubbing systems. The idea is that you have a material which absorbs water and carbon dioxide or whatever at high pressure at a molecular level. The gas molecules are squeezed into pores that preferentially accept the molecules that you want to eliminate. And then once the material is saturated, the pressure is then reduced and the molecules start to escape. So now you can absorb from the cabin environment at high pressure. And then once that's saturated, you expose it now to the vacuum of space to let the bad stuff leak out. And the idea is you'll typically have two of these running in a cycle, swinging the pressure back and forth, hence a pressure swing system. So yeah, you can eliminate the canisters as a consumable if you accept that you're going to have a much more complicated scrubbing system. Uh, on the, so the, on the ISS, the functionality is provided by a device called the Carbon Dioxide Removal Assembly, CDRA. And yeah, uh, unlike the chemical scrubbers, that isn't going to need the water. So you would actually need a separate dedicated humidity control system regardless of your gas scrubbing system. For example, on Mercury, there was a sponge which air was blown over and that would absorb moisture and then it would be periodically squeezed to sort of collect the water. On the Dragon spacecraft, there's a dehumidifier loop that uses a, a chemical or substance called naphion. It's a membrane. One side is exposed to the air of the cabin and the other side is exposed essentially to vacuum. And the membrane will let the water cross through, but not the oxygen or the nitrogen. But yeah, we can actually do better than simply dumping the carbon dioxide and water into space. Now, think about it. Both carbon dioxide and water contain oxygen. But if there was a process to recover the oxygen, then you could reduce the amount of new oxygen needed to sustain the crew. And I'm sure you know that water can be electrolyzed into hydrogen and oxygen. And yeah, the primary source of oxygen on the uh, space station isn't bottles of oxygen shipped up. It's ox oxygen that is formed from the electrolysis of water from the water supply. Now, that leaves you with hydrogen, but you can use that hydrogen to actually recover oxygen from the carbon dioxide. There's the Sabatier reaction, and that works by combining carbon dioxide and hydrogen at high pressure, high temperature with a catalyst in a reaction vessel. And that produces methane and water. And that water can, of course, be fed back into the electrolysis system while the methane gets dumped overboard. And this is pretty much what's been done on the International Space Station to reduce the amount of oxygen needed to maintain the environment. Now, it's far from perfect. There's more hydrogen needed than oxygen. So half the carbon dioxide still needs to get dumped overboard using, but the, the rest is handled by the Sabatier reaction. 
But one way they get around this is to ship up extra hydrogen, either as like a compressed gas or liquid hydrogen, because hydrogen is a lot lighter than shipping up water. But storing hydrogen adds all sorts of technical complications that kind of diminish its mass advantage. So there are other steps that have been studied to recover more oxygen with less hydrogen needed. One option is to take the methane and then convert it into acetylene via plasma pyrolysis. So the gas is basically converted to a high temperature plasma using microwaves and a bunch of reactions happen, but the main one is you generate acetylene. And that's a pair of carbon atoms joined by a triple bond and a pair of hydrogen atoms. So it recovers now 75% of the hydrogen from the methane, and this can then be fed back into the Sabatier reaction, raising the recovery of uh, oxygen significantly, while then you dump the acetylene overboard, of course. The, the chemistry is never this simple. Maybe 90% of the reaction products are the acetylene you want, but you also get side chain reactions, things like ethane, ethylene, carbon soot, and uh, carbon monoxide, and all these things need to be dealt with while recovering your hydrogen. Now, there's another process that's been experimented with that removes the carbon from methane via a vapor deposition process. Essentially, what you're doing is you're uh, breaking up the molecules and vaporizing the carbon, and it deposits out onto certain substrates preferentially, uh, while the hydrogen gas remains free, and that can be recovered for reuse. Now, that requires a specific substrate, and it's kind of like a filter, but you're depositing the carbon onto this, so you physically swap these uh, carbon substrates out and in, instead of carrying a whole bunch of excess oxygen to space. Now, there's also the possibility of replacing the Sabatier process with the Bosch process. And this has been investigated by NASA since the 1960s. And this uses a, another series of reactions to take carbon dioxide and hydrogen and produce water and solid carbon. And again, the problem is in the final stage catalyst, right? If you're doing something which is taking the carbon out of carbon dioxide, it has to go somewhere. So it ends up deposited on the surface of the catalyst that slowly gets choked up over time and needs replaced. There have been a few iterations on this design to reduce the catalyst use and the maintenance requires. And like, you don't want an astronaut having to start chiseling chunks of carbon out of a, a something in zero G environment. That would not be fun or safe. Fundamentally, this comes from the fact that the basic glucose molecule at the heart of human metabolism is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And unless you can put that carbon to use, you're going to end up needing to get rid of that carbon somehow, and ideally just the carbon and nothing else. Now, I've talked about water being recovered as part of the humidity control process, but water recovery and recycling is an important part of the space station life support system. That is the system that turns yesterday's coffee into today's coffee. It's obviously relevant to the atmosphere conditioning as it's taking water from the humidity control system, but the water ends up going into the same place as water from the toilets and other systems. Uh, and the systems on the space station have undergone a slow evolution over the last 20 years using combinations of centrifugal separators, filters, catalytic breakdown of organic molecules and distillation to return clean water to be used again. So what happens is the water goes in at one end and it comes out uh, clean water in one section and concentrated impurities in the other side. You get a brine that gets harder and harder to process as it gets more and more concentrated. So there's actually a couple of different water processing uh, systems on the space station. One was built by Russia, one was built by uh, the US and other international partners. And it, pretty much you take your water in and you run it through multiple filters. Like the first one is a 300 micron filter that captures biofilms and stuff. Then you have like a degassing cycle in the centrifugal system. And uh, then you pump it through an even finer filter, like a 0.5 micron filter to remove particulates. Then there's a, like a filtration bed that re removes certain molecules. And then if there's molecules, organic molecules are left over, those get destroyed in like a catalytic reactor where they heat it up and they break down organic molecules. And then finally, there's a f another like a gas removal stage because some of these organic molecules may have broken down into that. And ultimately, yeah, you, the the materials that come out the other end, uh, you then treat with iodine as a biocide and you store the water in a storage tank uh, 
prior for delivery to the astronauts once again. And typically by this process, they get about 90% of the water recovered and about 10% that's left that can't be processed further, right? But in the last few years, they actually, there's a demonstration of a new like technology to push them further. They managed to get up to 98% recovery using the new brine processor assembly. And this has a specially designed bladder with a membrane which will allow the water to pass through it. And so they heat it up and the water comes out. And, you know, they just reasoned that they could pass this water vapor into the station environment and have it recovered by the atmosphere processing. But then they found that it was creating some bad smells. So they had to add a filter. Yes, uh, the, it, the, the specific phrasing I found in the paper was, early dewatering cycles of the BPA have unfortunately imparted significant odor impacts to crew. Since the first dewatering cycle, odor mitigation efforts have incorporated a dedicated exhaust filter strategically designed to reduce urine-themed odor-generating constituents in the cabin atmosphere. Oh yes, I love scientific papers. But yeah, in the end, the brine it still has to be disposed of. And a lot of the filters need to be periodically replaced to keep the system running. And I found this paper from 2017 that talked about space station water use. And they had stated that between the hardware breakdowns and the filter replacements, for every one kilogram of water produced by the system, they had replaced 0.18 kilograms of hardware and consumables. And presumably that has improved since then because this is a work in progress, but it's important to realize that state-of-the-art water processing still has all sorts of consumables to make the stuff palatable to the human palate. And yeah, and then of course there's the poop, which doesn't actually have much in the way of recycling technology right now in space flight. At best, I think it's freeze dried to recover the moisture and you know they can dump it overboard or typically they'll put that in a return spacecraft but it turns out that even shit has a use in deep space it makes sense to actually keep this stuff around because if there is a cosmic ray event a solar storm that acts as a shield so if you have that on the spacecraft it'll block some of the stuff and i believe artemis actually has a legitimate plan that if there is a solar storm they will take everything that they can find and create like a pillow fort of all the bags and everything around them, including the waste bags. So they will be protecting themselves with shit. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the ultimate goal in spaceflight would be to have a fully regenerative system, something that perhaps uses biological processes or biological-like processes to recycle the atmosphere, the water, the waste, and then grow plants, make food, close that loop entirely, and that may one day happen, but consider the amount of farmland that's needed on Earth to grow food for one person. Now imagine a spacecraft that size and you see why the experiments growing food on the International Space Station are a very small scale compared to what would ultimately be needed for long-term habitation. But you know, there is all sorts of intermediate possibilities for bioreactors that could be used at various steps in uh, environment processing, and those are being investigated. And since I mentioned small scale, there is one really easy way to reduce life support requirements for a human crew, a concept which has indisputable math backing it up. And yet it will offend some people more than the idea of drinking their own urine, worse than the thought of making a pillow fort out of poop. To reduce the mass of life support consumables required for a long mission, you can simply use humans that need less life support, smaller people. On average, it turns out that the average woman needs less consumables than the average man. So a long duration mission with a crew selected entirely on merit would be mostly women. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe. <laughs>